Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm glad you've come here this morning. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, I, I realize uh, maybe some of us, we didn't get a chance to meet our family, and I hope you did. Um, it's good to see some family guests. Uh, I had got to did spend some time with my family, and it was nice. I, you know, in 2020, um, I think I appreciate those family moments even more. And I really did appreciate just, you know, having that moment together. And I'm glad God has given us a beautiful church to come to and to that we should worship together. And uh, it's, it's I, you know what, I, I, I said in 2020, I said, you know what, it really makes me appreciate church even more. It makes me really appreciate Sabbath even, even more if possible. Uh, because I realize it's been a difficult year and I'm glad we're here together. Uh, to worship. I want to let the people in the, in the home watching this know that uh, on December 2nd, our freeze does end. Um, at this moment, we don't know if the Governor Brown will change, uh, but we'll, we, we are out of the freeze December 2nd, but we will email you um, if the government changes that, and we'll let you know uh, of what's going on. But uh, we live in a kind of a I don't know, it's kind of a dark moment, not, not moment, so we don't know. So I pray we'll continue to be blessed here at church, uh, that we'll continue to praise God and, and enjoy our time together. Well, this morning we have a praise service brought by the Parish family, and uh, also Kathy will be also be doing the children's story this morning. Uh, may you be blessed in the Sabbath worship this morning. God bless. Happy Sabbath! We welcome you, those of you that are home and joining us this Sabbath, and those of you who are here. Um, we're going to start out with um, four songs, and our first one is Who You Say I Am. i 
Our next song is The Wonderful Cross. What a blessing that cross is to all of us.
Our next song is He Reigns. Um, I've heard this song before on the radio, and, but I haven't sang it before, so it's kind of new to me. It might be kind of new to you, but I'm sure you'll grow to love it, and I'm sure we'll do it again sometime, too. last song we are singing a cappella and I hope you people at home are singing with us you can sing either part first part or second part I'm, I'm sure this is probably one most of you know sing hallelujah to the Jesus is Lord of heaven and 
shepherd, I'm his sheep. He is the shepherd, I'm his sheep. He is the shepherd, I'm his sheep. Oh, shepherd, he is the shepherd. He Hi, boys and girls. It is story time. I'm recording this Friday night, so I don't know if there's any boys and girls out there. I, I hope there's some. I hope there's some at home that are listening. I'm going to tell you a story that happened a long time ago when I was in high school. Now, um, we moved a lot, but um, my last two years of high school, we were living in a little town called Tualatin, which isn't too far from here, and it was a really little town back in those days, and it didn't have a high school. So we rode a bus. Um, I and my brothers and sisters into Tigard, and I went to Tigard High. Um, a lot of my brothers and sisters rode that same bus that were at the junior high. And um, some of you may know that if you ride on a school bus, or any school bus actually, when it comes to a train crossing, the bus has to come to a complete stop. And then the driver looks out the window right beside her. And then she opens the door and she looks down the tracks that way. And if it's all clear, she closes the door and she drives across the track and on her way. Well, on our bus ride between Tualatin and Tigard, there was a train track. So every day going to school and every day coming home, we crossed that train track. Well, one day we were on our way home and we were getting close to home and we were at the train track. And she stopped the bus like usual, and she looked to the left, and then she opened the door, and she looked to the right, and then she closed the door, and she started. Well, as she was starting across the tracks, the crossing signals signaled. And if you know, there's bright red lights that flash, and there's a sound that goes ding, 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 and then the arms start to drop. Well, we, we, I saw the lights flashing, and I heard the ding, ding. And I happened to be on the right side of the bus, and I looked down the tracks, and sure enough, a ways down there, there was a train coming our way. But you know, we were halfway across the tracks by then, and we went across the tracks, and the arms dropped down, and we went on our way. Well, that night, we were at dinner, and my sister said to my mom and dad, our, tra our bus almost got hit by a train today. It missed us by maybe about this much. And I started laughing because I thought that was so funny because the train had been way down there and to say it had missed us by this much. But I realized that when those bells started going ding, 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 my sister became extremely scared. And she wasn't 
meaning to lie to my mom and dad about the bus almost hitting us, but that is how she actually saw the situation. She thought we were in danger and that train was going to hit us. And you know, boys and girls, it is that way with each one of us. Each one of us sees the world a little bit different. And yeah, you may be someone who climbs the tree to the very top, and maybe your friend is afraid to even get in the tree. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your friend. It's just that he maybe sees the world a little different than you see the world. So we need, we need to remember that. As adults, we need to remember that, that not everybody is looking at the situation the same way we are. And we need to consider their feelings and how they are feeling about each thing that happens. Thank you, boys and girls. Good morning, church family. It's my privilege to get to lead you in a season of prayer. If you'd bow your heads, we'll seek the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church family, either here in church or remotely at our homes, and, and we give thanks. We give thanks for the protection that you've given each one of us, the loving care that you've showered upon each one of us, and uh, just the fact that you pay attention to this small and insignificant piece of dust in the universe and uh, allow us to continue on a path that leads to our eventual salvation and return to heaven. But right now there are some challenges that we all face. And uh, I would ask for your continued attention and for your intervention. As we navigate the world around us with powers and princes that vie for each other's uh, control over, over us, over your children. I would pray to you today as, as a church family that those politicians and those in power that would follow your will and follow your character, that you would that you would guide them and bless them and cause them to succeed. And for those that work against you and your character, I would ask that you would eliminate them from the scene, make their plans and their, their wishes uh, of no effect. And that you would once again allow us to worship in, in freedom and love and, and family. So, this is totally and completely within your power and authority to do. So we, as your children, are asking you and inviting you to do it. Amen. There are individuals that are facing situations within our family. Um, normally we would know what they are because we'd be, we'd be fellowshipping with them. But you know what they are. So reach out individually to families and individuals and and bless them and heal them in, in physical and spiritual and, and uh, mental ways. Help them to be healthy in all aspects of their life. And continue to allow us to worship together as best we can. And know that you are our God. And that we worship you with love and respect We pray these things in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy, thanks, happy two days after Thanksgiving Day. Um, I hope that, you know, like Pastor said, you know, it's, it's such an interesting time. And that time that we have with family is so valuable. And I just pray that everyone had a good time. No drama, hopefully. No arguing at the table. But a, but a lovely time fellowshipping with their family. 
Uh, we're going to be reading some scripture today. I'm, I'm letting you know in advance, we're going to be reading a lot of verses. I hope that's okay with everyone this morning, reading out of the Bible. Uh, before, we, before we jump right in, let's pray. God, we thank you, and we love you, and we appreciate your guidance and your love for us. Jesus, I'm just asking that you be with me, and that you speak today, and that this sermon be a one-size-fits-all sermon for those who are watching and those in attendance. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're going to be in Acts chapter 25, the book of Acts chapter 25. And we're really going to be diving into the story of Paul and his, his journey through the court system in Rome. And, uh, and we're really going to be building into the, to a climax here. It says, three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea to take over his new responsibilities, he left for Jerusalem, where the leading priests and other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. They asked Festus a favor to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. And so we, we step into this scene and there's drama, of course, with Paul and with the Jews, and they want to kill him. And 40 or so said, you know, we're not going to eat or drink until this man is dead. And so they plot to, to kill him and ambush him on the way. But Festus replied that Paul was at Caesarea, and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. Verse 6, about ten, eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day, he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they could not prove. And so that's, that's the framework of the setting we're stepping into. And it's, it's, it's not related to our sermon, but it must be said, we see these religious and spiritual issues being masked as political issues, right? The, the, involving the government into spirit, spiritual and religious issues. And I think a sermon for another day is, is that's the place that we're headed in. These spiritual and religious issues being masked and it's, and it's happening as we speak. Verse 8 says, Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? But Paul replied, no. This is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried right here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I am an innocent man, no one has the right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors and then replied, very well, you have appealed to Caesar and to Caesar you will go. And, and there's two things of note here as we continue to build to one idea here. But, but it's, it's fascinating that Paul would rather deal with a heathen, pagan government over a chosen people. Fascinating, right? You want to go to Jerusalem? No, I want to go to Caesar. I'd rather deal with them than deal with y'all. And, and I got to thinking about where we're at. And, and the church should be leading to be the first resort, not the last response. You see that. We, we, we may not have all the answers in this community. In fact, we may not have many answers. But the church should be the first place that people want to go to find some answers rather than the last resort, oh, I'm just going to go there when I've tried everything else. The second thing of note is that Paul is so, is so different than Jesus before Roman government. Jesus was submissive, Jesus was quiet, Jesus just, just turned the other cheek, right? And, and, and was, was a lamb that was slain. And Paul is the exact opposite. Loud, bold, bra bravado almost, right? It, he says, if, 
if I have done something wrong of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I'm innocent, no one has the right to turn me over. Bold, huge, big, long language, demanding. And, and I think oftentimes when we look at what it's like to, to live this Christian experience, we often only identify with Jesus. We only identify with turning the other cheek, being the lamb. But Paul gives us a framework here that it's okay to stand up for what's right. We don't have to lay down. We, we can stand up. We can say enough is enough. And, and we might get to a point when that needs to be done. So a few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. Remember, Festus took over for Felix. And so this is sort of his inauguration into power. And they come and they discuss. I mean, they spend, you know, a day or so talking over what happened and, and what is Festus' plan for how he's going to rule. And, and so in conversation, they talk about what's going to happen with Paul. And so they continue on in talking, and he says, you know, I don't have anything to write uh, for Caesar. What am I going to say? This man wants to go see him. He seems innocent to me. And so in verse 22, I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said. And Festus replied, you will tomorrow. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city, a who's who affair. King Agrippa's in town. Wherever he goes, I go. And so all these men are there, and uh, he, he, he goes on and, and, and has, his, has his moment. Then in chapter 26, then, then King Agrippa said to Paul, you may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hands, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders, for I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now, please listen to me carefully, patiently. And it's fascinating, right? Because I'm, I'm reading this and I'm going, is, is Paul kissing a little booty right now? Is he smooching up to, to King Agrippa? Is he stroking some ego here? But, but I think it's twofold, right? I think he, he, the King Agrippa may be more equipped to handle this based on his past, but it's just fascinating the way that he starts this, this, his soliloquy. Verse four, as the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish, Jewish training from the earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of the religion. He continues on, verse nine, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison and I cast my vote against them. When they were condemned to death, many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. You know how angry you got to be to chase somebody down? He goes on, he talks about the vision. He talks about his vision with Jesus and him telling you are persecuting me. He goes on, verse 19, so King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven, verse 22, but God has protected me right up to this present time. So I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. And in this way, announce God's light to the Jews and Gentiles alike. And so I'm, I'm just reading this. I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing this. And, and, and all of a sudden it dawns on me out of everything before this great pomp, before, before the great authorities and these men of power and King Agrippa and Festus, this new, this new governor, this new senator, out of everything to defend himself, he gives his testimony. That's fascinating. Out of everything he could have said, out of all the intellectual Paul's a, a very intelligent man. He could have proved his innocence and brought evidence to the table and, and said, I was here, and they said this, and I said this. But the, the thing that he attempts to defend himself is his story. And I got to thinking, 
I over-intellectualize. I don't know about you guys, but I'm an overthinker. I'm a classic overthinker. I just think and think and write and notes and I'm constantly trying to connect dots. And, and I was reading this and I'm like, okay, when it comes to the defense of my faith and it comes to the defense of trying to bring someone closer to Jesus, all I need is my story. I, I don't have to, to be this genius. I don't have to, to be this over intellectual, high IQ. I just need my story. And, and that's what we see here, and it's amazing. Notice Festus's response to Paul's story. Verse 24, suddenly Festus shout, shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. Anybody been called crazy before? I've been called crazy before for the way that I think, for the way that I act, for the way that I eat. You know, I enjoy a good hearty breakfast in the morning. But in this hearty breakfast, I have my eggs, I have my morning star sausage, I have a couple pieces of bread, maybe a side of a pancake. Yes, I had like a big breakfast. But I, instead of just putting the syrup on my pancakes, I pour the syrup on everything. I heard a no. You might think that I'm crazy. So I've, uh, when, when people f see me at first in the morning and I'm eating breakfast with people who haven't eaten breakfast and they see me just sort of drizzling everything, you should see their faces. They think I'm crazy. He says, Paul, you are insane. You've lost your mind. Too much study has made you crazy. And, I, and, and it, it's just fascinating because if there's one thing out of the whole world that I want to be called crazy for, it's for my faith. If there's one thing that I want to be called crazy for, if there's one thing I want to be identified as crazy for, it's for my belief in Jesus. I hope one day that I tell my testimony and my testimony is so crazy to someone that they'd say, you are crazy. I hope to have that story. He says, but Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth. Kirk Franklin is a gospel artist. I don't know if you ever heard of him. I, I, I love sort of, some of his music is amazing. It's great. But he has on one of his albums, it's an intro to a song. And in the intro to the song, he says, the truth can hurt you or the truth can change you. And that's what's happening here. Either the truth's hurting somebody or it's gonna change somebody. And King Agrippa, Paul says, knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure these things are all familiar to him. For they were not done in a corner. They were not done in secret. They were not done in hiding. This was done in the wide open. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Paul, Paul's going ham right here. And not ham as in I know we're in an Adventist church, not pork, but going ham, like going wild. He's just, he's, his, he's presenting an argument that feels unmatched. He's going ham. I know you do, King Agrippa. And so the, you can imagine all the authorities, all the, the people with great pomp and money, right? The 1% of this town, of this area, all stop and look to the king. What is he going to say? What, what's, what's the response going to be? King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. We reach the height of this moment. I know you do, says Paul. You almost persuade me to become 
a Christian almost. The definition of almost is this, slightly short, slightly short of or not quite accomplished all but. All but. Truly sums up the word, doesn't it? I believe that the word almost is one, if not the most dangerous word in all of the Christian experience and maybe all of the English language. Almost. I almost went there. I almost got baptized. I almost married her. I almost went to church. I almost, I almost, I almost. A poet once said, of all the words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. Take that in. It might have been. Almost. What might have been what could have been nearly, next time, just about, almost speaks of missed opportunity. Are you with me this morning? Almost speaks of missed opportunity. I remember, I'm, I mean, I'm about 17, and I'm in the height of my athletic ability. It's dwindling every year. Every year it goes down. But at 17, I was at the height. And I loved basketball. And so it's funny because in my school, the best players in that, that played basketball didn't play for varsity. We played for fun in a rec league, rec ball. And I remember there was one game in particular. I was sort of the shooting guard and the point guard, but this time my shooting guard was, was out of commission, and so it was just me kind of running the floor, running the court. And boy, did I have a, a heck of a game. Woo! It was just the ball was going in, the passes were crazy, I was dribbling out of my mind. It was just amazing. I felt like an NBA player. And so it, we come to the end of the game. We're down to... I'm going against, I still remember his name, Ben Minerly's team. And so I get the ball. There's, I think there's like 5.4 seconds left on the clock, and it's just rec ball, right? But I feel like the world is on my shoulders. I feel amazing. I want the ball. I come up. I'm at the top of the key, and I'm wide open. And I'm ready to take that shot, and I just let it go, and I'm like, this is it. I'm going to get lifted. My name's going to be in the Raptors. This is, this is my biggest moment ever in sports. And it, and it just, it feels good off the hand. It's going in. I'm like, oh, this is, oh, no. I'm going to have a good rest of the, the evening. And, and as I'm watching this ball go in, it's one of those, it's, it's easy enough to miss an air ball or to have one clank off the rim all ugly. But this was one that rattled in then rattled out. Devastation. But that's almost. Rattling in, then rattling out. The question is, what in my life, what in your life has almost happened? What in your life are you almost doing? I know for me, I'm almost working out every day. I'm, I almost do it every day. I don't end up doing it, but I'm this close every day. I almost made that call to my family member. I almost, I almost uh, reached out to, to a friend or a family that I know is in trouble. I almost preached the gospel to my coworker. I almost, I almost, I almost. I almost quit my job to pursue something I truly love. The question, the statement is different for all of us, but what is almost happening in our life or not, and how do I turn almost into action? There was this, I was sort of digging around in almost, and I stumbled upon this case, and uh, in down south, one of those states, I forgot the state, but they still have the death penalty, and there's not many left. And so the, this man was accused of murder, and I mean, the, the list of what this man was accused of was super long. And so they come in the courtroom, they present the prosecution, the defendants, they, they sort of go back and forth. It's this whole thing, high profile case. I mean, the TVs, right, everything. The next day they come, and the defendants ask for an ex parte 
And an ex parte means, can we speak to the judge without the prosecution knowing? Judge Granson, they have a conversation. You know, this man comes in with his defendants, he's quiet, but the judge cracks him open, they have this conversation, and this, this story is all told by the bailiff. And he's watching and seeing the responses, and all of a sudden the, 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 they adjourn, and the bailiff sees that the judge kind of wants to let him go. He kind of believes him, but it's a high-profile case. The response would be wild, right? So he convicts him to, 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 to die, and, and that was it. A few weeks later, the bailiff comes to him. What happened? I kind of saw that you were kind of, you were kind of vibing with his story. You kind of believed him. You, you, had a, you, you were leaning to let him go. Didn't he do enough, or in this case, not enough to get, to get uh, sentenced? And the judge said, almost. You know who that judge is? That judge is Pontius Pilate, and the man is Jesus. And Pontius Pilate was this close to letting Jesus go, almost. But he didn't. And am I almost letting go of Jesus? It's 2020. Am I almost, am I this close? So Paul says in his brilliance, again, he's just going nuts. I mean, the, the intellect that's happening, the Holy Spirit's moving. He says, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. I hope that almost and altogether you become me fervent for the Lord except for these chains. Don't end up where I'm at. So how do I get here? How do I turn my almost into action? That's the question. How do I turn my almost in my life into action? And the Bible has an amazing answer. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Don't lose this verse. Let this verse be an anthem for your Christian experience. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. I spoke in the grapevine. For those who read it, I spoke on the words that we tell ourselves, the I can'ts, the I won'ts, the I don'ts. And at the end, I wrote almost. And this word takes the cake because almost brings guilt. But Jesus has something for us. He says in second chapter, verse 13 of Philippians, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Take that in. God is giving you the desire, the want to, when you don't want to, God can give you the want to and the way to do his good pleasure. God can help me want to when I almost don't want to. I, I close with this message. Jesus never had room for almost. Take that in. Jesus, God, doesn't have room for almost. With him, nearly has to become certainly. Sometimes has to become always. And next time has to become this time. Because an almost is as good as a never. The... the the question this morning is, what is almost happening in my life? And can I come to God asking for not only the, the, the will, the want to, but also the way to do his good pleasure? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God. And you, God, you're telling us in the Bible that you give us the want to when we don't want to and the way to do your good pleasure. Father, there are so many things we're almost doing in our lives. We're almost waking up in the morning to have devotion with you. We're almost praying every night before we go to bed. We're almost finishing that study that we started a few months ago but haven't, haven't really gotten time to do it. 
I'm almost preaching the gospel to my friends or my, I'm almost God. We're, we're, we're a people full of almost. But Jesus, we're asking you to turn our almosts into action, to give us the will and the way to do your good pleasure. Jesus, you are powerful and you are amazing and you can do this. So as you work with us over the next coming days and weeks and months, God, we're asking that you turn our almosts into action. Thank you, Lord, because you are amazing, you are awesome, you are loving, and you are kind. You don't almost forgive us, you forgive us. You don't almost love us, you love us. So we don't almost ask in your name, we ask in your name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let us all say, amen. Amen.